And may God have mercy on us all. That's good. Oh, and you can get listen up for only fourteen ninety nine. So we're just having conversation. We're doing. We're here at the Texas Annual Conference in the walkway, which people are not really sure what to make about all this. But um, I got Bishop Thomas Bickerton, who you are now the president of the Council of Bishops of the United Methodist Church, which means you're like. Or like does that make you like the king bishop? Are you like the patriarch or? Uh, well, it's like the pope. They say the pope. It's the pope of Methodism. Ooh. Oh, isn't that something? No, that's nice. So that's yeah, that is nice. Where's do you get a white outfit, and yeah, red got shoes? Little, got a little. Uh, Little, the, the little mitre hat, the little mitre yeah, hat. Yeah, yeah, that's and, cool. Yeah, when I was when I was a pastor, uh, when I was no, when I, when I was a bishop in Western Pennsylvania, we did flood relief, and we worked in a Greek Orthodox house. Mm-hmm. And the the guy found out I was a bishop, and he kept saying, "Your Eminence, I can't believe you're here. Your Eminence, I can't believe you're here." <laughs> that's awesome. And so my cabinet heard this all day long, and they got me a mitre hat and had engraved on it your eminence. your eminence and then on the front door of my office they'd put a sign that said your eminence domain so <laughs> it felt like i'd arrived well i thought we'd just we're, we're just talking with different folks that are here and before um whatever the next thing is that happens i thought it'd be good to you you recently i think it kind of made the rounds in the methodist church had a kind of a state of the church address mm-hmm. And um, people who are United Methodists probably paid attention to it, but maybe other people didn't. But I think it was really good. I, I read it again. And you talk about some experiences you had growing up. Uh, but then I mean, t- t- you, you talk about it. I mean, what, what stood out to you and what, what were you trying to communicate to people in our denomination? Well, you know, John, we're in a big period of transition. And the temptation is for us to try to go back to the way it was before. I'm, yeah. I'm not interested in us going back to the way it was before. I I, th- I think we were pretty racist before pre-COVID. We were pretty sexist, pretty homophobic. We were, we were, we, we had problems before COVID ever came along in terms of our sustainability. Yeah. And it's, it's time for a new day. And a, a part of that is... I think going back far enough to reclaim the essence of who we were to begin with. So a lot of stories that I tell these days are about my childhood. Growing up in the church where I was I was affirmed, I was welcomed. Um, when life was tough in those, in those years in middle school and high school, that was my refuge from the storm. Yeah. And, you know, if it wasn't for that kind of culture within the church I don't know where I'd be today and I think we've lost that in a lot of, in large measure because we've we've segmented people we've we've determined and judged that they had to fit a certain criteria if they were to be welcome and we've got to get back to the uh, to the basic understanding of who we are as United Methodist Christians that are we are people that are filled with grace and with hopefulness with our, our job is to transmit joy and love. I'm a benefactor of all that stuff. Yeah, I, yeah. I live that every day. No, me too. My parents were divorced when I was 14, <clears throat> and the church was the place that, yeah. that I was able to get plugged in and stretch my wings and, and be loved on. And you know, a guy became like a father to me, you know, was in the church. And so that was, you. there was something that you said that stood out to me. Um, you said, sadly, the decline of our church has been a result of the de-emphasis of our evangelistic mission to make disciples and an overemphasis on the inevitable polarization caused by trying to determine whether you're a traditionalist or a progressive or a centrist or a whatever. That, that struck me because we were talking to somebody recently who actually said, you know, all this that's going on in the church is actually, it's okay. You don't like it, but it's okay mm-hmm. because like last night when we had worship in 30 years that was the most uplifting moment of worship in any annual conference I've ever really? been in wow. it was something about walking in the room and just the spirit in the room was different mm-hmm. instead of like you know there's camps and caucuses and groups and that are like politicking and angling and trying to you know position themselves in certain ways and you walk in the room and you, know, you like you know that's not it's not there anymore right and so i wouldn't say it's just because certain people are gone but i would just say the people in the room are leaning in a different way 
I mean, it's a spirit. You can just hear it in the room. <clears throat> it's a gut check. Yeah. I mean, our backs have been up against the wall. Um, we, we're sobered by what all's happened to us. And, and you can just pick a topic. I mean, sobered by COVID, sober, sobered by disaffiliation, sobered by the constant debate. And you reach a point of, of realization that, you know, either we're going to get our act together or we're gone. And I'm not interested in us being gone. So to go into a worship service like that yesterday was pretty uplifting for me, too, because there's a sense of hopefulness. People want to. Yeah. And there's got to be this spirit of want to that's created again. That's the whole comment about the reemphasizing our evangelistic spirit. We, uh, we've we got to be willing to tell the story of God's love to people who are desperately in need of it. And i one of those ones that still believe that that invitation is pretty compelling. Yeah. I, I've also, the way that I see it, everybody talks about that United Methodist Church is being, you know, that we're caving into the culture. And what I see is completely opposite of that. I think what caves into the culture is to become more tribal, more separated, right. more siloed, more homogeneous, which is what you see happening when churches split or whatever else. I think the harder work is to have a church that has Republicans and Democrats, conservatives and liberals, traditionalists and progressives, and hold it together on something that's more common. And so when Jesus, you know, when I look at the life, the ministry, the words, the teaching and modeling Jesus sitting at the table with sinners and tax collectors and not checking them at the doors like, okay, are you, did you, you got everything clean now? Are you good? And it never means that he condones their actions, but he condones them. Right. And now we still are arguing about we want to be biblical, but we don't want certain people at the table. And as uh, someone who's more conservative and traditional, I read that. I was like, you got to confront with the, the scripture. If you're biblical, you know, how do you how do you deal with that? If you're biblical, my interpretation is everyone has a place at the table. Yeah. That's what Jesus. I, I, I think that's right. That, I mean, that's, the, that's my latest read of the gospel. And it's so funny to me because, uh, <clears throat> well, I say funny. Every time I have conversations with, con, with my conservative brothers and sisters, they always want to go to, well, he said, go and send them more. Go and send them more. Go and send them more. And I'm like, y- you know what he said, like, immediately before that? Mm-hmm. He said, I don't condemn you. I don't condemn you. Right. <laughs> right. And so it's like we, we kind of emphasize the parts that we want. But... What, what's given you hope now as you look ahead? I mean, the, I, I was Drew McIntyre was on our podcast last week, and he said, you know, for a church that sort of made a move that acknowledged the reality of divorce and remarriage, mm-hmm. we shouldn't be really um, so quite so torn up over what's happening. It's, I lament it. It's sad. We don't want it. But even for bro- my brothers and sisters who felt like uh, they can't be in the United Methodist Church anymore, they're probably going through the same thing wherever they're meeting and going, wow, it's just so much better now. Yeah. And if, so if we were at that tension, like you said, where we've been spending all of our time and, and energy on these definitions and separating ourselves in-house, if it, if it gets to the point where we're not a part we're not focused on our mission anymore yeah i mean then maybe that maybe it is time to right the, to, the, the question is how's that working for you you know that that polarization how's that worked for us the last couple of decades it hasn't worked for us at all and it's reached a point of of no return and that's okay um it's inevitable it, it needed to happen um and, it, and my sense of hopefulness is that we are, we are reprioritizing what's important to us at this point because we know we have to. And, you know, that comment you made earlier about someone says we've leaned too much into the culture. You know, um, I frankly want to lean into the culture uh, yeah. because there are things I want to learn about the culture so that I can relate the gospel message to it. If you don't understand the culture around you, then you're never going to be able to address it. Then the place where we've become like the culture is that we've we really have become very much like the culture in terms of a strong independent movement uh, a high degree of skepticism and cynicism Lack around trust around trust and authority <clears throat> and and we bought into that and i think what what gives me hope is also my dream my my dream is that we might replicate what tertullian said look at those christians how they love one another. Yeah. And if we can model 
what it means for a conservative, a liberal, and a moderate to sit at table in a mature way, honor one another, respect one another's viewpoints, and realize that if we, if we respect one another's viewpoints, we've got three branches of evangelism that's going to transform the world. Yeah, yeah. It's not siloed. It's, it's, it's branches on the tree, and we're more like the face of Christ when we're all together than we are if we're apart from I think it's another. harder. It is hard. Uh, it's much easier to be in a room where everybody thinks like I do. I like those rooms. <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, look at the disciples. It was pretty hard when, when Jesus was crucified. They went and hid under the bushes. They didn't know what to do. They didn't know where to turn next. When he ascended, they didn't know how to give voice to the movement. Yeah. It, it, it was, it's, a, it's been a trust posture the whole time of allowing the presence of God to transform us so that we can do what we need to do. We're at that moment right now again. Yeah, I, I think going through the pain of the actual <laughs> rending the garments, you know, has been hard, I think, for a lot of churches and a lot, and a lot of the conferences in the Southeast and South Central have, have experienced a lot of that. Yep. It's happened everywhere, but that's really been the, big, the biggest part of it. But um, yeah, I think there's a sense of hopeful future. I know in, uh, in South Georgia, they just had their big vote. We had right. it in December. They just had it. And so I'm, I'm interested to hear from some of my friends, what, a, what is their conference going to look like? What is that going to feel like and sense like? Because we're going to start we're going to start sensing like what we're sensing here. You're going to start seeing that everywhere else. We always yep. kind of meet early, so it'll be interesting to see yep. how we it's, can shoot. The church is going to be different and it needs to be different. That's been part of our disease the last 50 years is that we we tried to accommodate everything rather than adapting ourselves to changing times and circumstances and need. I, I was in Cincinnati last week for a meeting and um, on Sunday morning, I'm a big baseball fan. Yeah. Sunday morning I woke up and I checked my phone about the, you know, what's going on in the sports world. The Reds were playing the Yankees mm. and the Yankees always draw well. The starting pitch, the opening pitch on Sunday morning was at 11.35 a.m. Hmm. I'd never seen that at a major league game before. Yeah. And so I, I went to the meeting and someone else had picked up on that and they said, can you believe it? The Cincinnati Reds have stolen our time slot. And my response was, I don't think they stole anything. I think we gave it away. And, and if, if there are things that are occupying the traditional time slot, if we believe in the gospel en enough, change the time slot, yeah. adapt to the circumstances. I have a Chinese church in New York City that has a very meager attendance on Sunday morning, but they're one of my largest attending churches because they meet on Monday night. Hmm. The, the Chinese workers all work in the service industries all throughout Manhattan on Sunday. And so their principal worship service is Monday night, and they're averaging over a thousand people on Monday night. Wow. You, you adapt to the circumstances and you don't bemoan it, you capitalize on it. Let the spirit work and move in ways that we mortal humans can't even begin to conceive of. Yeah. So as president of the Council of Bishops, we can kind of wrap this up on this, but I, I want to hear what do you think? So what's what comes next as far as like, I know we're going to be the church and we're going to, um, you know, I think there's some new energy and hope and there's excitement going on. But there's also some things I think people who left had some valid criticisms of mm -hmm. our bloated bureaucracy and <clears throat> unable to make changes very nimbly. Um, what do you what do you think is going to happen here uh, next for the United Methodist Church? I mean, restructuring and you know, or, or any of that stuff. I I think the next four years is absolutely pivotal. Uh, we'll see is the answer. Um, I'm not going to be naive and say, oh, it's all going to be great and glorious and we're going to be just fine. I don't know. Um, can we make the pivot administratively? Can we make the pivot? Uh, from being an, an older bureaucratic-led system to a more nimble operation. I, I think we'll see. I think the, the issue right on the horizon is regionalization. That seems to be the hot topic going into General Conference next year. Um, and, and I think we have, to, we have to own up to the fact that colonialism has driven 
uh, our missional outreach to the Philippines, to Africa, and the parts of Europe. But now they're partners. They're not, they're not a mission project. Yeah, yeah. They're partners. <clears throat> so do we have the courage to make them equal partners in the midst of our administrative system? Regionalization it will be one of the makes or breaks of, of the degree to which this denomination can remain global. Um, I personally think, John, there's going to be there's going to be some death uh, because I I like to say to the people at New York I I want to dance with the people that want to dance and I don't really have a lot of time to teach people how to dance that don't want to. Um, we're going to see who's who's able to dance and who's able to make the shifts. I th I think we're going to see we had we had a lot of problems before COVID ever came along, mm -hmm. issues of sustainability. Those issues are still there. Uh, so I think there are going to be places that are not going to be able to dance that are going to die. Uh, but I believe that we're going to see a pretty significant remnant of people that want to be the church. And the testimony of that's in this room yeah. in the Texas Annual Conference. You, you've got people who want to be United Methodist. They don't know quite how to take the next step, but they've got the spirit to want to. If, if we can mold them and shape them into a new reality of what the church can be, it's a hopeful future. If they're unable, then uh, we're going to have to face some more sobering And when you ahead. say able versus unable, what do you mean? Well, <clears throat> adaptive, uh, yeah, resiliency. I think, I, I, think um, I saw a video the other day of an Episcopalian strategist, and he flashed up this uh, picture on the screen of a, of a church with about 12 people in it, and they were all gray-haired like you and yeah, me. Yeah, yeah. And the guy said, uh, this is a typical church. And he said, but, but in the day when many of us were growing up, we were sitting with our parents behind them. We were in the back rows because we were unruly kids sticking yeah, yeah. gum under the pews. But he said, the thing about this picture is there's nobody sitting behind them. It's just those 12 people. Interesting, yeah. And so there, he said, there, the frustration of those groups of people is that if they're using a, a, a battle illustration, they're in a battle but there's no there's no cavalry there's no second wave to come and support them. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, you know, to be quite honest, we've lost about three generations of people who we baptized well, we confirmed well, we we enthused them in youth group. They went off to college and they never came back. Yeah, no, we see that. And so, you know, our ability to give this church away in order to be relevant to emerging generations will be one of our greatest challenges moving forward. Um, we, we've got to be able to allow uh, that generation to say, these are the things in the culture today that matter enough for us to invest religion in. Yeah. And we'll see how that goes. I'm optimistic about it, but I'm also realistic. realistic. Yeah. Todd Bolsinger says that, you know, Older adults in the church are always talking about, we got to reach young people, we got to reach young people. And he's like, but that means you're going to have to dive to the things that you want and that yeah. you like in your church because the reason they're not there is because <laughs> they, they always want to reach the next generation, want to reach young people, but I don't want to change anything the way that we exactly. do anything. And so part of it is, is I, and I think that's going to happen. I, um, I think the church really has an opportunity now to be a, wi a witness in our, in our, especially in our American society culture, with all the stuff that's going on with the the, 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 the splitting up, the division, the polarization, the partisanship, the tribalism. And I think if we can really model Jesus, that's going to be the countercultural move exactly. for us. And and this is not the first time this has happened. I mean, there have been other generations and years long past where people didn't want to have anything to do with organized religion. They didn't trust it. The culture was toxic. We, we think that what we go through in our, in our era is unique to us. History is cyclical. Mm -hmm. um, and, and there will be a revival because people have hunger out there. They have need out there. They're going to hunt, they're gonna hunt for, uh, for it until they find it. I personally believe we have the theology that's most relevant to the need. We just have to learn how to proclaim it. That goes back to the statement I made before. Yeah. We must focus on our evangelistic witness again, or we'll never feed the passions of the particular issues that we may have within the church. 
we've got to grow this thing again. Well, and I think that's one of the fears for um, the continuing, like conservatives and traditionalists, is like, are we going to just become an activist church for progressive causes, or are we just are we going to be a Jesus church? And to me, the way I see it is like, if you're going to be a Jesus church, there's going to be room for everybody. Yep. And it's, but it's not going to be activist per se. I mean, there's things that you have to work for justice. You have to be active when I say active about that. But it doesn't become like uh, identified with a caucus. It's like one, one caucus owns that denomination. And that's going to be, that's where it's always hard. Right. Is to make, if you're going to say you're going to have room for everybody, you've got to have room for everybody. That's exactly right. And, and, I, and I think there is room for that. I mean, I, I grew up in the church in the day and time when all those things were active, church and society and, and women's rights and um, discipleship ministries and um, vibrant youth ministries. I mean, I grew up in the era when the church was really alive and you saw health in all those branches because it was fed from the roots. Mm -hmm. Now, if we only focus on a branch, that branch will wither and die. Yeah. It has to be fed spiritually, no matter whether you're an advocate or a, a Jesus follower, as you say. It's all got to be fed from the same source. That gives me hope because I like the feeder system. It just needs, we just need a little pruning and a little fertilizing to get yeah. it flowing again. Well, that's a good, good place to end the hope. The feeder system, right? Absolutely. Uh, thanks for stopping by. Hey, thanks, man. I thanks mean, for doing I this. I didn't really give you a choice. <laughs> <laughs> I told, told you you had to, so I don't know. Well, we've been trying to do this for some time. I know, so but it's we better it. we got it in person instead Absolutely. of a Zoom call somewhere. Oh, my gosh. I'm, I'm Zoomed out. So uh, kind of have a way we end, uh, end this where I just I say my name and you say your name. But make sure Jeff always makes me say make sure you subscribe and like and five stars and leave a rating because that helps our algorithm. So I'm John Stevens. I'm Tom Bickerton. And this is Pod Have Mercy. Oh, 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 oh